know the artists behind the epic melodies, songs, and beats. Celebrating the best new music from around the world. This is the A State of Trance podcast. Yes, welcome to a new podcast with a very special, I would say, almost a royal <laughs> member of the dance music industry here in the studio, Nick Chicane. Hello, mate. How are you? Good. It's really weird because we have been chatting for the last half hour already, yeah. which have could have been a podcast as well. <laughs> so yeah, there might have been a few expletives we would have had to take out, actually, Ruben. <laughs> we don't, we, in we don't take anything out. We can do. Okay. That's a nice thing about a podcast. You can do whatever. <laughs> Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Just don't say anything that's Just don't say anything that incriminates you. you end up in court. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Be careful, Nicholas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because we might hold you to that. Um, well, normally I would say let's start at the beginning of, of you getting into dance music, but you pretty much invented dance music. So it's really, <laughs> no, no. Let's go back to the, to the times that you started making music and started making dance music. Mm. I would love to know what inspired you to, to get going in it. Um, Right back in the day, inspired by the likes of Vangelis and Jean-Michel Jarre, mm -hmm. I ran. I was on a holiday in the Isle of Wight, where I now live. Ran yeah. past a tent, which was playing Jean-Michel Jarre. And previous to that, I was schooled in classical music and all that sort of malarkey. And I heard this sound, and I went, what? The synthesizer sounds. Yeah, and I went, what is that? And um, fast forward to... Did you run in and check what it was? Or? Yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. Because there was no Shazams back then, so... <laughs> it was actually an album called The Essential by Jean-Michel Jarre. It was a compilation album that came out, Christ knows when. And uh, and I listened, you know, it was stuff like Oxygen and stuff. And I, I remember listening to it. It wasn't just electronic music, by the way. Yeah. We're talking about Jarre, who was, was a very brilliant uh, cr crafting the melodies and uh, haunting stuff. And I remember hearing it and going... I think I can do that, which is a really strange thing to yeah. say when you're about eight. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I kind of, I fell into doing art school and all those things because I was dyslexic and you find lots of DJs and, and artists and people in the music industry and creatives aren't very good at sums and mm -hmm. English and stuff. So I fell into that stereotypical thing and I was, I, you know, and I was writing music and then, I somehow stuck, uh, this is about 1992 or three, mm -hmm. dance music was happening, rave culture in the UK and all that kind of thing. And I, for some reason, decided I needed to start working with DJs because I was just very, very much Vangelisy, very much yeah. synth, synth driven, not dancing. Like haunting, weird Yeah, weird, weird stuff. all that kind of stuff. And um I, I got working with various DJs and started to understand dance music. And really, I'm like a composer. But how did that go? Like there, there was a DJ performing and you would walk up to them? I just, or got, I just got friendly with some local DJs. Yeah. You were like, hey, uh, do you guys want to get some music? Yeah. I, you, I, I, had, I had a basic studio. He, we brought some, he brought some vinyls with sample stuff, yeah. some beats and put things together. And it was kind of very basic dance production you had some early software like Cubase or whatever and you sort of higgledy piggledy made these dance records and that's how it begins and obviously you don't get to hear all the terrible versions of say <laughs> offshore that that went before it you know and I you know and really you know I'm a composer that got shanghaied into dance music and never made his way back <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not too bad to be honest so you started out making music Pretty much the the early ghost writing days, I would say, for local DJs. Yes, yeah, so you would make was, music for them, and we were just. I was just making this thing, and uh, I didn't know what it what it was and how it sounded. It needed. It was. It was synthesizers. It was slightly sad sounding, and I remember I wanted to make this kind of thing that sounded like dancey U2 kind of euphoria and uh, m mash those kind of genres together. And um, uh, there was a lot of really interesting experimentation. So back then, I'm going into the studio and we had what we call happy accidents. Oh, yeah. that that's I love that bit. Keep that bit and stuff. And now I don't really write or work la like that anymore. I'm very, I work in my head a lot as well, which, yeah. I, which sounds like, bit nutty but um no, I'm, i think it makes a lot of sense because we spoke about it with other artists here in the studio as well back in the days when you needed to make music especially if you were sharing studios with someone else hmm. you would have like 
cardboard boxes with your presets and stuff because you couldn't save anything right so oh. most of the times you were making music and you had one day to work on it and that's it oh yeah I so mean, it put a lot more pr- pressure on it and you had to make decisions really fast right i uh, the luxury now of swapping projects you know yeah i'm, I'm currently working on 20 odd rec- tracks at, the, at this given moment um salt water which is the one that really i remember most being up on the mixing desk and in the studio for something like three to four months it was there it was an analog desk all the synths were in the right place and you literally had to take two or three days off to come back to it to go oh that's what's wrong with it to get your perspective on it and and that's how it worked and really it, it was just really old school stuff and everything went out of tune you know, I we used to run an Atari STE computer for sequencing, and it used to do these wonderful things, right? So you do this song, and it save it onto floppy disks, yeah. And then when you went to open it again, it went, "Oh, we haven't got enough memory." <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got, oh, no. And you just go and take your your computer and get it yeah. expanded, you know, and <laughs> uh, it, all sorts of terrible things. But um, these are all the bits that kind of. You know, you're the sum of your parts. All that studio stuff is is where you are now. You can't swap it. It's True. All- yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you started making music like that, and then the first thing that you did was starting disco. Um, it was Disco Citizens. Yeah. Uh, track- That's, that was something that started before she came. Yeah, it was right here, right now. Um, which, believe it or not. It's going to make an appearance on the new Chicane album. Okay. I've actually gone back to my very, very first record. Um, yeah, that was quite fun. Uh, uh, but that was also mental. It was crazy. I remember put together this really anthemic sounding record, pressed up a thousand vinyls, blagged a mailing list, sent it to Judge Jules, Pete Tong, Pool on Confort, all the movers and shakers, and, and a bunch of record companies. Records started to hype. People started to play it. Pete played it, and, and all of a sudden, the phone started ringing. And it was record companies trying to sign you. Yeah, and it was like it was a weird time, but f- just an incredible time as well, an incredible rush. And that was my first record, and that went top forty in the UK. My very first record, and um, but so much effort you had to make the song, press it on vinyl, oh, yeah. send it out, wait for weeks for for something to get. Back to you or yeah, something like that? Yeah. I mean, people, I think people forget how it worked back there. You were basically a kind of ragged record company. Yeah. You were the promoter. You were the, the creator. You were the guy that did the, the design. Because I was a graphic designer as well. So I did all the, all the graphics for it. And um, yeah, it was mad. But what was really mad about it was um, I had a kind of cr- shitty graphics job yeah. for the local Pronto print. In, in the in the neighbouring town and I remember speaking to my parents and I said to them look I really think I can I can do this music thing Yeah. and I said can you support me for three months while I have a go at this and that first record went to number one and I can remember crying because I can remember realising this can be done Yeah. Uh, you know you don't sit you don't leave school and go oh, I want to be a dance producer I want to be a DJ or a superstar blah 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 just say yes bye bye yeah. <laughs> the men in white coats are waiting for yeah. you, uh, you know. especially so, back in those days yeah and, and this is this is 1996 you yeah. know and I was like wow so that's kind of how it all started and it was really really exciting um, it, uh, and I say that because you couldn't make records back then. You know, you really had to be a boffin in the studio, and and you then you had to be a bit of a bit of a boy shopping your shopping your record and just doing all those things. And it was it was um, it was a fascinating time. And then I did the, the, exactly the same thing with Offshore. Yeah. Uh, I I created the Chicane together with the Leo Allstock. Together with Leo, yeah. So Leo and I did um, right here, right now, together as well. Yeah. Leo and I went to college together. Yeah. And we're all, and that's where we met. And Leo was a DJ and great ideas. And um, we wanted to do a different sound than um, what was Disco Citizens. And as everyone knows, the first Chicane record, Offshore, was, was a downtown. The whole project's meant to be a flipping, beautiful, down tempo, <laughs> chill out thing. And here we are. Flipping 27 years later, and it's I'm into this. I'm still having to skate dance. <laughs> You're still dance, a dance music producer. <laughs> dance world, you know. Um, 
So we did this thing, but we did the same thing. Uh, I, I, we made this beautiful record. Press but you already had the connections through Disco Citizens, right? right. But you, you took a different path. Mm. So I did this record. Leo and I pressed it up, did the graphics. And then something weird kind of started happening. Sasha and Digweed started playing it. Because yeah. it was a breakbeat track, yeah. the original. Started playing it with, trying to play it with a four by four kick because uh, they loved it so much. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? So I did a Disco Citizens mix yeah. on it. And that was the thing that broke the camel's back and everything went crazy from there onwards, really. And there was a big frenzy trying to sign me. And, ah, uh, you know, that whole record company thing, you know, getting to bed with the devil <laughs> to, 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 to get anywhere, you know. <laughs> They were they were crazy times, you know, and you know next minute we had I don't know seven or eight top ten records and a number one record in the UK, you know, and 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 around the world and stuff, and that's that was a bit mental, really. Um, yeah, because there was not a lot of dance music crossing the channel back in the days, also from the UK to let's say to the Netherlands, and I remember very well, vividly. I think Nina has the same growing up with these tunes on TV and on radio as well. Well, it was really weird because uh, Radio One, the national, the, the huge radio station, yeah. you know, it, it was such a different structure to what we have now, yeah. you know, because obviously we have Spotify and all those kind of things, which are radio stations that you choose the playlist. Yeah. On. But radio, or the algorithm chooses. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Talk about that later. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the... Um, the we had we put a, basically an instrumental four and a half minute record on the A list at Radio One, and it was completely unheard of. Yeah, and because these were in the times that Radio One would play what a Bexy Boys, yeah, <laughs> Captain Jack, yeah, it, it was it <laughs> those was, kind of things. It was pop culture, so yeah. I was part of that avalanche of records which underground started becoming overground. So there was this process, and the process went like this. First of all, had to make a great record. You got you got Danny Ramplin, Pete Tong, Judge Jules, Andy Durant, those guys to play your record. And next minute, there was a shift within the record companies. All the DJs that were out up and down the country became the ANRs yeah. for the record companies. They listened to what was going on. Next minute, your record got signed. If it got played enough, it jumps on the C list at Radio One. And then we're in a whole decade of dance culture and the whole thing went bananas. Yeah. It was, it, it felt, because, because you lived it and it was happening, you didn't really, it's buzzing. you didn't really see it for what it was. It was just happening, yeah. you know, and, um, and now looking back, it was, it was a pivotal stuff. Yeah. I think um, in the Netherlands, we had the, the dance department, which is still it was being run by Armin right now. We had the same kind of thing, but BBC One Radio, I think, I remember being a young DJ, the first thing I would do on Monday morning is check all the playlists of Radio One yeah. just to see what's new, like, hey, or at a certain point when I started making music, yeah. just want to see if Judge Jules played my track or whatever, you know? It's exciting times. It was, it was... And it was not on demand, everything. Yeah, it was really, it was, it was really kind of groundbreaking, but because it was just happening, you didn't, you didn't think of it that way. Yeah. When you're in it, you never think of it that way. It's when people says to me, oh, it must have been amazing when you were writing those records. And I said, you must have yeah, loved it. And I went, no, I was really stressed trying <laughs> to write the next one. And, uh, I was just sort of like rabbit in the headlights, you know, trying to keep all the plates spinning and all the balls in the air. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a really crazy time. Um, so all of those kind of producers and all the people that were doing all those records, um, there's not a lot of us left kicking about. Uh, I, I'm clearly very stubborn <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm, and I'm still, I'm still doing it, but that's fundamentally because I'm a, I think I'm a writer rather than just a kind of a DJ particularly. And, uh, 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 it's all about melody for me and always has been. And, and I try to inject a, 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 an element of longevity in everything that I do, you know? Yeah. And, um, it's fascinating to see the shifts that are happening now within dance music yeah. and dance culture. Because unfortunately, BBC One hardly plays any dance music anymore. <laughs> well, well, they do, but it's only the, the, it, the British ones. When so. it does, it, it, I'm not sure they're the right ones, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's I a different discussion. I also find it interesting because you say, like, I'm one of the only ones who's still there. Mm. But I was talking to Benno de Gouy about your music, mm. and then he told me that you were basically one of the first who made the um, 
crossover to dance music and kind of pop music because you had like Brian Adams on your record, yeah. for example. And I think maybe that's also, you had this, this shift towards dance music becoming pop music. Maybe that's also part of why you're still there I, because you're one of the originators of that. Yeah, I, I walked a very narrow tightrope between having a record which was played in the clubs and it was credible and also it was able to be on the radio. That's a rather unusual thing to do. And I don't do it deliberately. It's just that's how so it, is, yeah. that's how yeah. it comes out. And I'm very, very lucky that that's how it comes out. Yeah. So it doesn't... Uh, yeah, I've done pop stuff. I've, you know, I've written records for Cher and I did remixes for Bewitched. And, I, I you know, I love music, you know, as an entity. But... um yeah, I, I did this thing which seemed to sort of leap leap genres slightly, which is kind of weird. Yeah, Not and you, you released an album, of course, the, from Far From The Men In Crowds, which mm. includes all of these hits that you were just mentioning. Yeah. Um, and now, all these years later, you made a new version of that. Because that's the one of the main reasons why you're here, of course. Yeah, and it was, thank you for having me on to play, play some of it. Um, yeah. uh, why am I doing that? You know, it's... 27 years ago or whatever it is I've lost count see that's really worrying <laughs> I can't even remember when I did it so um, why am I doing that um, well, well you can think about it first a little bit because uh, there's still more to discuss I yeah, guess sure. uh, because you started releasing all those tunes uh, the, the hits were coming along and and also what you said it, that was funny because I was r- doing a little bit of research that you said that all these DJs became A&Rs because yeah. it happened for you as well, because Alex Gold signed one yeah. of your tracks, and yeah. from that moment on, you started releasing music with Extravaganza. Yeah. So, from that moment on, did you start making music f- with Alex Gold in mind, or were you still making music no, just for I, yourself? I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I make music for no one other than yeah. myself. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've always been that way, and we were talking earlier, and um, it's quite funny because the tempo currently for music is 130, 235, wherever it is. <laughs> I was doing a record this week at 120 beats per minute, yeah. which is, um, I just do it for myself. Yeah. You know, and that's really rather important. The moment you go around trying to please someone, um, you're not really doing it for, for the right reasons. Does that make sense? I don't know. It sounds, yeah. like, sounds yeah. like a rather yeah. selfish statement. <laughs> no, I think, the, I, think, I think that's the most important thing to do as an artist, because otherwise, I always say like, if you, if you follow the trends, then, you know, Someone, you you will be you disappearing. Keep, you have to keep current. You're not, yeah. You dip your toe in. What's going on? You know, but you've got to. It's got to be you, and that's what people. That's really what people are buying. Not people. Not buying the person that's playing the music that they think you're playing. I'm playing them. I think. I think I'm playing. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, but also like people become fans of music that they hear outside of the club that they have great memories to. So if there's mm. no heart in the music, then people won't make memories to it, I guess. That's a great point, Nina. I mean, the um, the music, I think I, I, I do, sometimes Sometimes it's very emotive. Sometimes it's it's very true to how I'm feeling, you know, and great artists are like that. I'm not saying I'm a great artist, but there's some honesty in it, you know, and I think people can hear honesty in music, um, you know, uh it's, it's quite hard to articulate, but that, I think that's one of the things I like to think that um, happens within what I do. Yeah. And the funny thing is that the album, I, I think you would never even imagine that, that 25, I saw this also, 25 years after the release, it became silver in the UK, the album. It's crazy. Isn't selling it? over 60,000 copies. So that means that throughout maybe three or four generations of dance music lovers, people are always coming back to... I, d- album. I, I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get that? Well, when was when did it go silver? The eighth, the eighth of September, over twenty five years since the original release, the album was certified silver in the UK by BPI, selling over sixty thousand copies last yeah. year. Yeah, nobody told me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, don't you love that? <laughs> I guess I guess you still have some. Cut. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess you have a platter to to pick up. I guess I've got a couple of discs, and 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 I feel I feel really weird. I think they're in the toilet at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. It's weird, but no. But guess I think you should be allowed to those of comp- accomplishments. Yeah. You should put them away. Well, they're Speak not proud they're of not them. Away. They're in the they're in, they're in, in the, the toilet. They're in the shitter. You have a big uh, toilet then. Well, <laughs> I, 
I'm not really into m- many of those things. I'm quite self-conscious, but um, he says for quite a man that talks too much. But um, yeah, uh, I've got a gold. I've got a couple of gold discs and some and other. I don't know. Not really. Not really my thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least there you go. 25 years. That, so that kind of proves the point that the, you, the music that you made are pretty much evergreens. Yeah, yeah it's interesting stuff. It's yeah. interesting stuff. Um, and now you're bringing back that album. Now we can talk about it. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> Finally, because uh, oh, on the March yeah. 1st, you're releasing Far From The Madden, uh, Madden Crowd, the symphony rehearsal. So that, yeah, so this started off as an idea last, well, I don't know why it's an idea, because uh, they're already structured and written in that manner. Yeah. Stra- straight away. Or, the orchestral yeah, they're, 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 bits and pieces in there. Yeah. yeah, they're already, you know, the way I, kind of constructed those records was in a kind of classical format if you listen to because of your education in the past yeah and it's not deliberate just how it came out so if you listen to the if you go to the early versions of offshore there's a whole there's lots of the legato strings doing Mm -hmm. long bowing stuff and um it makes perfect sense to 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 revisit that Uh, uh, uh so we it started off as an idea i tell you what we should probably do this as as a show yeah and there's been a thing for a long time for bands, whether you're whether you're James, Wade, you two, whoever, to, to do a show where they play the the album from beginning to end as as the audience would have listened to it back yeah. in their car or whatever. So mm-hmm. we thought, okay, so why don't we let's take that album and and do it? And then we thought, well, should 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 it be re reinvent re invented to be done with an orchestra? So. Yeah. Um, and it's not a complete orchestra. I actually, I, 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 I should say, it's not all the kettle drums and trombones. It's the majority of it is, is string sections and horns. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I went up to Manchester last year, and I and I, I, I met a great guy called Joe Dell who um helped me helped me score out the, the actual thing. Yeah. So you took your music and created scores out of it, and then yeah, it's g- quite g- it's yeah. quite a process. I can imagine because yeah, you have to write all these notes down and it's everything quite, it's quite funny and because I, I would send him chunks of the stems of of, yeah. of, of what i had and, he, and he'd ring me up and go nick what the hell is this what's that, <laughs> what the fuck is this bit and, I, yeah. and i'm like yeah uh because because it, I, it was just some of it was just chaotic yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they go there was one piece in particular where i did something absolutely random and i changed the time signature uh, uh, halfway through the, the track i think it's the o- uh, opening number early and we had a nosebleed with it yeah so i, I unbeknown to me i changed the time signature on the fucking hit anyway <laughs> so i worked with this guy great and joe's great so um we went up and we did a rehearsal and we, we thought Do you know what let's record it all yeah so we got it didn't intend to do anything with it um and for for million reasons the show didn't happen last year we're going to try and do the show this year. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I thought, what does this, what does this sound like? And, uh, and the rehearsals are amazing. There's loads of artifacts and noises and clunks and stuff. And I took the majority of all the drums off the original tracks. And it's like far from the maddening crowd, symphonic unplugged. So there's, there's very little drums in it. Yeah. The whole, and you get to hear kind of how the thing not should have sounded, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was supposed to be back in 1997. Well, do you know? Do you know what? I talk about this quite a lot, and and, and I use this phrase back in 1996 and earlier. I was a really frustrated artist because in my head, I knew how I wanted it to happen, but the techniques and the technology and the production know-how mm-hmm. wasn't there. Yeah, it's pretty much caught up to my head now. Yeah, so. I had this phrase, I had, you had what you want and then you get what you get. Yeah. Right? And when I think about it now, um, I, I've i got what I want and I got what I got. <laughs> um, so it's really fascinating listening to those things and I'm, I'm really, really excited about the show. The show is going to be something else because um, for all my years in music, I haven't ever s- stood in front of an orchestra physically playing my stuff Mm -hmm. and it is the most bizarre thing because 
We, well, actually, most people listen to bloody music coming out the, the horrible speakers on your iPhone or a single speaker, which is mono, yeah. or a stereo left and right. The closest thing is 5.1. The Dolby, the Dolby yeah. surround. Yeah. When you, when you go and you sit and listen to an orchestra, and I've only done it a few times, I went and saw Gladiator, the film, and, and the, they played the score in front of you. Yeah. And when you're in front of it, uh, let's say you're stood right in the centre of the orchestra. The violins are placed over there and the cello's over here and the viola's there and, and the, the bass is... It's like surround sound, but not like you've ever experienced because you're in it. And um, So much details. Yeah, yeah, and I was just like, oh, yeah. Because it doesn't... I, I'll be honest with you, it does not translate on recorded no. material. It oh. simply does not. So the live show, when we do it, this year, uh, haven't quite worked out what it's going to be. It's a big. It's going to be a big place. Could be something like the Albert Hall. Not sure. Back yeah. back in the UK, uh, and it might be something we even think about touring. Um, I would love to see it. Yeah, I, but I, there, I, there I must really, be. Like, there must be a very very expensive thing to yeah. tour around with. Ah, uh, yeah. I haven't spoken to Louis about that. Bit, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's just don't worry. Because about how, how big is the orchestra that that recorded? Uh, this piece? Uh, I think that was 30 pieces. <laughs> um, and of course, that's there's all the miking and everything that goes with that. Um, yeah. And whenever you're working with an orchestra, it's um, um, it's very strange, actually, because the first time I ever did something with an orchestra, mm -hmm. I, I remember saying to them, oh, can you just uh, just, just, just play that bit again and just, just, just drop that note there? They don't work like that. No. Because... Then they are effectively machines yeah. and they will only play what's in front of them. Yeah. And I learned my lesson with that. So, and also they go out of tune, you know, everything, you know, uh, they're living machines and it's, um, it's going to be good fun. Really, really good fun. Is there already a dot on the, dot on the horizon where it's going to be the first performance or? It'll be this year. This year. It'll be this year. Um, and it'll be probably London. Okay. Uh, and, but it's something I'm looking to do more of, you know, behind the sun will probably be the second one. Yeah. Uh, but we'll play, the, we'll play the show from beginning to end yeah. uh, and then I'll probably DJ for a bit or, or no, I haven't quite worked out the exact structure of, no. of the show. It's still a work in process. Yeah. It's, it's still in the rehearsal part. Yeah. And, and do you know what? Uh, it's like, I'm kind of, I've done it backwards, backwards because I'm releasing the rehearsals uh, before, yeah. <laughs> before we've even done it. And yeah, that's when I, when I saw a symphony rehearsal, I'm like, what for, is this? I asked James, the, your A&R, for? like, what are you sending me? What is this this, <laughs> this this project? Is it a project? Is it an album? What's going to happen? What's wrong with him? Yeah. Well, I mean, what's wrong with him? Um, I'll tell you what's wrong with me. Uh, I got, apart from having laryngitis and COVID and all that, all that. <laughs> the nature of the business, and you'll understand this, Ruben, because you tour and you work... Um, Ah, oh, so many facets. So, I'm the CEO of my record company. Yeah, Moderna. Uh, Moderna. Uh, I do my own radio show each week, uh, which is getting bigger and bigger and crazier and crazier. I do my own podcast. Mm -hmm. I shoot my own videos. I'm doing so many things. I haven't gone into the gigs. We were going up and down the country doing Sunsets Lives last week, last year. Um I'm sort of running out of time. Uh, I'm sort of stretching myself. And it's one of the things you never want to do is stretch yourself too thin yeah. and not, and something falls short. Yeah. So um, that's kind of what happened with the show. We, we, we just got crazy with other stuff. Uh, we did the album last year. That went mental. That was my biggest album so far to date, which was amazing. It was like number one in 10 or 11 different countries in the dance chart, you wow. know, uh, and including the states, it was number one in Dubai, um, national, top ten UK national, and um, he just. I, I'm finding that, I think more than ever. Just I think just also a bit of age creeping in. I, I've really got to focus on the priorities and and what's what's important and and uh, and you know I, I'm I've embarked on finishing another album this year. I should, I should just take myself out and have a real good word with myself because <laughs> I, I, I'm, but you know, I, I'm also, you know, I stopped drinking two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. My, my productivity went up. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to people about recovery and mental health. And I find myself in, in a, 
really purple patch with my productivity and mm -hmm. and what's happening. Uh, so, uh, but I'm just trying to I'm just trying to rein myself in a bit. You know, I can understand. <laughs> well, we we spoke about this with John Eskew because he he's also doing he's running a label. He's also managing a few artists, and he was talking about working with certain pillars. So, like color pillars, these are the priorities for the coming time for this yeah. this project. So. I guess that's the the way to do it. You work on your pillars and then what else is there? Then you have time to work on other it, projects. Was it also a reason why you got sober? Do you want to be more productive or? Um, it's a very interesting and long conversation. And I'll give, I'll give <laughs> Sorry you... Sorry for... Uh... I'll give you the... No, I'll give you the potted history. Uh, no, I just found myself uh, affecting my work. Um, I was... Uh, I'm sure Ruby can appreciate this. I was jetting around the world, drinking lots of vodka and Red Bull, uh, going on stage, feeling crap, getting up, do it again the next day, getting on a plane, get and um, yeah, you and, wear yourself out. It's impossible. And you wear yourself out. Um, I I'm 52 years old, and I started this in 1996. Okay, so uh, and I discovered that alcohol was was catching up with me, and I started to get into just a bad place with it, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's a class A drug if it was released today. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It's the most misunderstood drug. Of the but world. also, I think yeah. touring, uh, being a touring DJ, there's a lot of um, temptations also yeah. because everybody's offering these things to you. But uh, I quite, I found out quite quickly that uh, touring is actually top sports. Yeah. So let's say, because sometimes you, you, you don't sleep for three days in a row. It's impossible to People. also throw alcohol in there because, oh, yeah. or because you just destroy yourself. You only need to look at the Avicii situation yeah. to start to understand. And that was a pivotal moment when people started to go, what the fuck is going on here? Mm -hmm. And, you know... So they only see the glamorous side of things. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was joking with Nina earlier saying, you know, you're leaving a Lamborghini, you arrive in a helicopter. <laughs> like, fuck. Yeah. You know, I can, I can remember a situation probably just before COVID and I played, I think, the exchange in LA and somewhere in Soundbar in Chicago or something and, and somewhere else. And I found myself in a hotel lobby, really lonely, really tired, drinking drinking to knock back the seven hours wait before I go get the plane home. Um, you know, the great things of life are, are shit unless you've got someone to share them with. True, yeah. You know, and I, I was just becoming disenchanted with it uh and my body didn't like it anymore and i had to i had to make some changes you mm -hmm. know and uh and i spend a lot of my time working with people in recovery now mm -hmm. uh and talking about you know what's going on and the dangers of it all you know and it's not like i'm you know some granddad and saying you know you shouldn't do that everyone's got to find out for themselves you know I've had some hilarious times on tour. You know, I've got some terrible hijinks, most of which we can't discuss today. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, the interesting thing is, you know, from touring for 20 odd years, having stopped doing that, um, my life is inconsequentially better. I haven't had one row with my wife. I haven't had one thing go wrong. In fact, everything is better. So you've got to ask yourself some questions and reevaluate how we frame something like alcohol. Mm -hmm. Like we just said, it's a class A drug. You know, and we have this saying for people in recovery, you get drunk at your first drink and you go, well, no, I don't. I got drunk at tequila number 722. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and the reason we say that is because it's a mind altering substance, you know, and uh, after that first drink or drug, you can you can achieve anything. You can do anything. You you know. I I I had a temporary sponsor, a great friend of mine who remained nameless, who went out on a Friday night in London, woke up on a Sunday afternoon and on a, on a, on a sun lounger in Ibiza, and had no knowledge of how he got there. Mm -hmm. I started doing stuff like that. Yeah. So that's confronting. Yeah. So yeah, it's it, it, it was really interesting. But the, the most interesting thing is, is that my productivity has gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it used to take me about three years plus to do an album. Shit, I'm doing one a year at the minute. It's draining, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for, for sharing that with us. That's really nice. Well, it's important. I mean, yeah. uh, anyone that's in recovery or has had an issue with substance or abuse of any anything, um, talking about it is very important. You yeah. hear the phrase, a problem 
half as the problem shared. And that's exactly what yeah. happens in yeah. people in recovery. And actually, the amount of artists in recovery is astounding. It's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Because you take creative introvert people and we we are being forced into an extroverted world. So that's already... Uh, already a very hard thing to do for yeah. most of us so i guess yeah the easy way is to, to grab the bottle and just become or drugs or anything just to pursue something that you're not well it's uh you know uh, or make everything easier well we won't i won't go too deep into it but there's some very simple science behind drinking and drugging it's about dopamine and how it yeah. rewards your brain uh much like social media does for yeah. kids, you know and um and you go well why am i doing that what's that all about You know, and then when you don't drink or drug for two or three years, your your all your dopamine levels are really as you were like a ten year old or whatever. You yeah, know? and you get a kick out of life, and you go. Oh. So, if anyone that's got a problem right now and that's listening to this podcast, think back to when you were eight or ten. Did you use drink or drugs? Oh, you probably didn't. And did you have a good time? Yeah, I had a great time. I was out on my BMX. I was my mates. I was doing this. I was doing that. You know, and I get a kick out of music, and it's like. You then realize that alcohol and drugs are like fake dopamines, yeah. you know, and it's like when you look at dopamine in the, in, the, in the dictionary, it says wants to be repeated. Yeah. Yeah. That's why people swipe, 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 constant like mini hits of dopamine. Yes. I think it's concerning that it's, this is far away from any music related podcast right now, but yeah, I guess sorry, mate. <laughs> no, 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 it's, 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 it's fine. No, it's, it's actually nice to talk about this as well. Um, I think it's concerning that kids of such young age are being fed so much dopamine right now. Yeah, yeah and it's not... It's concerning. It, it's not... Also, it's not normal dopamine. It's, um, like you say, they swipe up. Uh, so let's take America. To be 21 to drink in America, yeah. kids have got iPhones age five or six probably. And the imagery is shocking imagery. So each post that the individual do, they want to grab someone's attention so they've got... I don't know, a cat falling out a window yeah. or whatever it is. And our brains aren't used to that. They're getting levels of dopamine that you would associate with doing cocaine. Yeah. 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 And that is absolutely, I'm not bullshitting, that's how it is. Yeah. It's fascinating stuff. But it's also like the idea of addiction, of what addiction is, people people don't really get it because people think, okay, I'm not addicted because I'm not under a bridge. I am not ho uh, yeah. homeless. I'm not, I don't, I like I have money. I have a job and people don't understand that addiction is not, you're not addicted to a substance, but your head is addicted. It's a disease in yeah. your head. It's a mental disease. So like if people would, if there would be more people talking about it and disease would get, this disease would get more recognition, then we, we can open up the discussion about when are you addicted? Like, w what's what's yeah. addiction to someone? Instead of just being like, okay, all these junkies or whatever, they, they are all those no lives living under well, bridges. It's, very, it's a very interesting thing, Nina, because um, from my experience, and I can say my experience, um, the people I've met in addiction and in recovery, there are some common threads that go through them. They're independent. Yeah. They're highly successful, uh, they're really driven, and they're probably obsessive. Yeah. And when I look at that, that's me. And when I, and when I got well, and I, well, I had a good look at myself, I went, um, you've got five Audis, McLaren, um, you run like a lunatic, your portion size when you eat crazy, You every single... Everything's extreme. Everything yeah. I do... Is I don't have a I don't have a I'll just do a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, but that's really common. Yeah. So, uh, and you see those. So it's like addiction is a byproduct of people that are really driven and and, and successful uh, to the extent people like Lewis Hamilton, Michael Schumacher, uh, Tiger Woods, people that have been obsessive about their sports, yeah. they're borderline addicts. If they flip, yeah. if it's flipped over, if that makes any sense, I don't know. 100%, yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's because otherwise you wouldn't be if you're so obsessed about something. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be so successful because you spend so much time and you put away a lot of time with friends, or, or yeah, so, you would skip certain things to achieve uh, a goal that you have in mind. So this yeah. comes round back to music. Okay, yeah. so the classic interview when Nick, you've been really lucky. You know, you've done all those things, and I went. No, you worked your butt off. I went, I wasn't lucky. I was just relentless. Yeah. So 
the bit where I, I was in the studio, I mean, I can remember going to college, yeah, everyone was drinking and drugging and shagging and doing all these things. I spent a decade, and I mean a decade, no girlfriend, no nothing, in the studio. Just making music. Just doing this thing. Yeah. And then when something started to work, and the thing that people don't really un understand about the people that are successful in our industry is that they are the sum of their parts, i.e., what you haven't seen is probably the 20,000 versions of things that they did before one, one stuck. You're throwing mud at the wall all the time, yeah? Eventually, a little bit sticks, and then you keep going. And the thing is, is that when I said, you know, there's not many people left from when I started, that's because I'm a nutcase. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a lot of people gave up after, especially if you, you you grew up in the early 2000s, I guess, making music, selling tons of records. You would hit the year 2005, uh, the vinyl sales are gone, yeah. CD sales are gone, and you're like, ah, this is not worth it anymore. Yeah. yeah. I think you're either a nutcase or you, you truly, it's you'd do it anyway if yeah. it wasn't... Because of the passion about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Music's a really bizarre thing. I spent a bit of time... Just, you know, as, as you would, downtime, trying to study and trying to understand what exactly music is. Because mm -hmm. it's sound waves on different frequencies which make you, which alter your mood. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like, it's very peculiar and it's our only global language. You know, how does someone know that that's a sad song? And, 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 it, and it, does, true, yeah. it does various things to you. And it's a really, it's a really tricky thing. And I, and I think of myself as a Pied Piper of music slightly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have you under control. <laughs> Here's a 400 hertz. Yeah. Like, ah. No, but do you also think that for DJs nowadays or producers that um, DJ, is it important to study music? Um, underst to understand what it is you're delving into, yeah, like I just discussed, it, it's a very curious medium. Uh, uh, but there's, like, what do you mean with... with study music because on one well, side you can you can study you can study chords or melody progression stuff like that but also on the other side you could study a certain synthesizer and just make it your own and so you understand how to make a certain well, sound well I kind of mean like studying un really studying music like um, knowing your chords knowing your music um. well there's uh, I know from experience I cannot teach you to write music uh, uh, Ruben's a writer um It, that's in you. I, 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 can, I can explain it, but it was like when I walked past this tent and I heard Jean-Michel come and I went, I can do that. Yeah. And it's, I've always been like that. And it's a really trippy thing. But you've got brilliantly trained musicians who can play amazing, you know. And I, I play the piano like I've got my fingers sellotaped together, you know. I am... <sighs> You should hear me try and do Poppy Holler live. It's yeah. it's a fucking car crash. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I digress. Uh, they're brilliant, but doesn't mean doesn't mean you can write no, music. I agree. I think Writing that's... music, it's almost it's almost a form of communication. It, it, it's putting down a, 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 a form of emotion that the listener understands and gets. It's, it's a bit that makes any sense. Yeah. No, it does make sense. No, I think I agree as well. But I was I was just asking because you said you actually studied music, right? I did, so, but yeah. I hated it. I was yeah. I was awful. I was awful. I did. I got classically trained in guitar and piano. But violin. I also think um, because I, we spoke about it with other artists as well that were classically trained and they wish that they weren't because mm. they learn how to use certain chords and progressive stuff like that, and they cannot deviate from it. So because they are trained into it, they, in their mind, it's the only correct way to cer do certain things. And I think if you're young and you don't, don't have any study of music, you're more free yeah. to do whatever, you know? Yeah, I mean, if, you, if, if, if it like, sounds nice, it's nice. Because I was dyslexic, I, I couldn't read music. So I only got so far with passing your, 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 your actual grades by a perfect pitch. Yeah. You know, I, I you know, my ears are... But I just do things in random ways, you know, and that's great. You know, I follow no rules. <laughs> <laughs> you make the rules. Well, I break them actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's get back to, to a couple of things that I really wanted to discuss with mm. you because obviously you have your own radio show, Sunsets. Yeah. Episode 500 is coming up. I know. What are you going to do? Something I, nice coming up. I was thinking about going on holiday. I thought, I thought <laughs> 
Five hundred hours is like what's that? Year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a math, math uh, um, wizard, either. <laughs> no, it's, it's um, yeah. Uh, Maybe another sunsets live on location. Well, we're doing some big sunsets lives this year. We did we did a whole bunch of stuff uh, last year where we we went somewhere different every month. Mm -hmm. We did the show. They weren't show. They weren't gigs. They were a bit like those circle gigs. You know, uh, they were find somewhere amazing. I love them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We do do the show somewhere crazy. The end of a pier. I mean, that, we did some mad shit. Um, we're going to do two or three events, okay. which will be sunset shows. The sunset show is quite difficult to pull off uh, unless the, the venue's correct. It's a Cafe Del Mar, kind of Cafe Mambo ethos yeah. where when I, <laughs> the whole thing started out by by wanting to do our own shows. So what what was it that I did that was unique? And it was that fact I had dance anthems on one hand and beautiful down tempos things. So we created sunsets and the idea was, and I also didn't, I don't adhere to that that banging full on thing. And, you know, people have their shows, you know, whether mm -hmm. you're, whether you're Armin Van Buren or above and beyond. My, my stuff was kind of like, um, start beautiful. The sun starts going down from the beach to the dance floor. And then it up, then it goes up tempo. And the idea is, is that it was never a club show. And we did a couple of shows this last year, which were amazing uh, in amazing venues where, I mean, I, I started off doing this ages ago. I did it. I did sunsets on the slopes when I lived out in the French Alps, mm -hmm. where when it came to uh, Apres and, and the sun was going down, I started off beautiful and then we did a fake sunset and then it went off uh, and that was messy, very messy. Um, so for, for places and venues where you haven't got the sun going down behind the sea, you know, um, we did one at the place called The Wave in Bristol. And that's an amazing inland surf resort. And it's just got the right vibe for what we do. Yeah. So we're going to do some very specific sunset shows this year. Okay. Uh, and it takes a long time to sort of put that thing together. Like, you know, it's always, it's been my brand for a while now, yeah. but it's not something you could just turn up and do it in the Ministry of Sound. It doesn't work like that. It, it, it's, it's location and weather dependent, shall we say. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because you need to have the sun and the set. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And another thing I want to talk about, because now you're in the podcast, but you also do a podcast yourself. We do, yeah. Um, sunsets after. After sunsets. After sunsets, sorry. Uh, tell us about it. Yeah. Because you have some interesting guests on there. Oh, some amazing guests on there. Um, yeah, that's all connected with recovery. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, also being wiser and a little bit older and is it a therapy session for yourself? Well, um, probably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're they're about how uh, it, the podcast should probably be called "How Life Was and How Life Is." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that caters for people that aren't in recovery or have had addiction issues because we've had some great guests on and all sorts of people coming up. Um, it's been really good fun doing that. Again, massively time time consuming, yeah, bet, yeah. and we got a studio. It's all white as well, not dissimilar to this, uh, <laughs> where we we film it just like this, and uh, it's really good fun. Uh, we're coming to the end of kind of our first sort of season of it, and I think we're going to have a little break, and then going to do another season at the end of the year. Uh, uh, because it, it, believe it or not, it's just a full time job trying to book the guests. There's there's basically me, my stepson Edward, and Louis. And that is the entire record company. Yeah. And we do all these things. So it's getting busy. I mean, I love after sunsets. I mean, I so mean, you put another pillar down. Yeah. <laughs> because you had enough time already. Well, yeah, it's <laughs> just kind of wow. Um, but to be honest, like it, it, when you come in with Louis, you, you should already record that because there's this non stop <laughs> stories and, and things, and yeah. you, you guys don't stop talking anyway. So you, you just record your guys 24 7. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. Louis's got some stories. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. No, it's been really, it's been really good. You know, I really enjoyed doing those sons, those shows. Um, but I've also got a little bit of a, little bit of an eye on the fact that, excuse my French, that but every fucker's doing a podcast now. Yeah, and um, I'm not sure I, I want to uh, whether I'll continue doing that because it's a bit like uphill snowboarding. <laughs> and I don't know. Yes really. or no? 
Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it depends what message you're trying to get across and, and what it represents for you, you know. Um, and yeah, you are probably right. It is probably slightly cathartic. Yeah. Well, it helps a lot, I guess. Yeah. Um, besides all the music that you're releasing, you also run a Patreon. Yeah. What made you start doing the Patreon? Well, that's part, that's part of the art. Yeah, yeah. So within the whole thing. So it's a website where people can subscribe and you get certain perks in return. Yeah. So, the, 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 so if I start at the beginning, we did, we started the radio show um, 10, 11 years ago. Yeah. And it's completely free. Everyone gets it, you know. But the reality of that is, Ruben, is that, like you know we've done 500 episodes of that nearly and actually it's starting to cost a lot to do it's time consuming yeah. and you know these things have to be have to do have to be maintain some sort of semblance of a business model yeah so after sunsets and all the bits that went with it sunsets live we do all the behind the scenes and you see how this stuff that was that was ideally meant to be uh uh a, a patron thing so people can you know subscribe and get more of this and that and the other so um and um yeah it, it, but it's it's slow it, these things don't happen overnight you no. know so yeah so we're, we're working with that um yeah i don't think there's anything we're not doing really uh, the only thing i'm not doing is race car driving or or yes <laughs> buying, a, <laughs> buying a hovercraft yeah yet. Oh. oh amazing so there's well Looking at things right now, there's a lot of things coming this year. Then, yeah. so you have your symphony shows coming up, some cool live streams. Your radio show keeps on going. You already told me you already finished an album. Yeah. You're gonna do more symphony um, rehearsal stuff on behind yeah, the sun, for we example. Got the album coming out in March for the symphony album. Yeah, coming out in March. that's March first. Yeah, and already another album coming at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of mental. <laughs> kind of mental. That's a lot of things, man. Yeah, it's it, yeah. I, I'm and. I'll be honest with you, uh, I've not been that that well. I got COVID over Christmas. As you can tell, my singing voice is slightly Fantastic. unusual. Fantastic. Wait, okay, here we go. Put on some reverb. Somewhere over the sea, waiting for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I've probably been pushing myself a bit too hard. I've got a big show uh, this weekend at the Steel Yard in London. That's a sold-out show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I got to take it maybe a little easier. <laughs> he says, I won't. That's a lie. <laughs> a lie. You haven't, done, you haven't been doing that in 25 years. So, But thank you so much for answering all these questions and giving oh, us a little pleasure. bit of insight of the world of chicane. Yeah, uh, listen, guys, I really appreciate it coming up. It's good to see you guys again. Yeah. So 1st of March, the album is coming out. Yeah. I think there's some bits and pieces already, you know, some teasers here and there already. Yeah, on, there's some teasers, yeah. And... Um, I've got a couple of very exciting new records for the new album. Awesome. I'm not saying anymore. Oh, you have to listen to it. I played you some earlier. You there know. you go. Easy. <laughs> guys. Thank you so much, Shikane. Thank um, you, buddy. Thank you for watching this podcast. We're going to be back with a new one very soon. Keep the eye on the socials. See you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in. Check all previous episodes on YouTube or your favorite podcast portal.